Another blood red sunset and yet another moon face and still another hundred miles to my next resting place. Driving down the road, eyes on the horizon. Within my car, I'm all alone. But feeling good and feeling strong, knowing that this path I'm on brings me to myself. I'm driving. Hey now, all, I'm Joey C. Welcome back to another episode of Spirit Sherpa. This is the show that helps and encourages you on your journey to unlock your magic mojo. With me, as always, is the spirit doctor, Kelly Sparta. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Joey. How's it going? It's raining. (laughs) It's raining. (laughs) So that's what you're hearing in the background is it's raining. (laughs) So if anybody hears that, hopefully they're not calmed and put to peace by rain and then they fall asleep while they're listening to this episode. That would not be good. Pull over. Pull over. (laughs) Pull over. Right. So we've got an interesting episode. We don't necessarily have a topic. We have multiple topics here today. Yeah. Well, we, (laughs) we've had such, it's been so funny because we had so many great questions come in. And at the same time, we had so many great topics to talk about. Right. We literally have not had time at the end of the episodes to answer the questions. And before we got too far afield from the questions, you know, we talked about it and we're like, well, maybe we'll just do a whole Q and a episode. (laughs) So that's what this is. And that's what it is. And we've got some, some really good questions. We've got questions from three different listeners here today that we're going to talk about, but the content sort of spreads all over the place. All over the place. (laughs) Yes. All right. So shall we jump right into it then? Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. First question. We're going to start off with a question from Renee and Renee H asks, I had my first awake premonition. I usually get these only in dreams. Is there a way to know if it means what I think it means or should I trust my interpretation? So we've talked quite a bit about dreams and and interpreting things like that. How does this tie in premonitions and stuff like that? How does this tie into some of the things we've talked about? So a premonition is similar in nature to dealing with like a, a dream or, you know, when we talked about thinking symbolically in terms of ritual and things like that, they're, they're all going to be uh, related to how do we bring information in from the energetic realm? And anytime you do that, anytime spirit is talking to you or you're working on an archetypal level, you're going to be dealing in symbols. Okay. And so premonitions are no different. They're often very symbolic, although depending on the person, they can also be very literal. Okay. So, you know, sometimes you actually see, you like go to the future and you see something happen, right? Mm-hmm. It, it depends on the person and how they're getting the information. And remember when we talked about the different types of spiritual gifts that people have and the different ways of being, and it's like, okay, are you a traveler and you're going forward in time or yeah. are you getting information downloaded from guides? So you're a channel and you're gathering information that way. How is the information coming in? And that determines how you're going to see it. Okay. If you're seeing it and it looks very literal, it probably is. Okay. But if you see something and there's like a goat walking through (laughs) a landscape and a car that comes running by and almost clips it and, you know, the sun is setting and it turns into a donut or, you know, something like that. Don't ask me what that one means. I have no idea. (laughs) But... (laughs) Because I'm just making this shit up. You're making me hungry, too. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Me, too. But, but, uh, you know, if, if, if it's that sort of thing, then you have to look at the meaning behind each of the symbols. Okay. If you've got something very literal, then it probably is just what it is. And if that's the interpretation that you have for it is probably the right one. Okay. If it's something very symbolic, it can be... So let's say, for instance, somebody is looking to get a job Mm -hmm. and they've been applying for jobs. They're trying to get a job with Exxon. You may have a dream, a prophecy. And so it's really more like a prophecy than a premonition, right? Because it's symbolic, right? Um, So you may have a prophecy that you see the person driving to the Exxon gas station. It might not even say Exxon. It might just be a gas station. 
mm-hmm. if you associate Exxon with gas. They could be going to a gas station and getting a great price on gas and filling up their tank. And that would mean they get the job mm-hmm. and they probably get a really good salary. <laughs> it's a good price. Yep. Or you could see them driving down the road and running out of gas. Okay. And that could mean they won't get the job. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying is that it can be this bizarre little twisty stuff that happens. You just made a um, an interesting distinction there, and I want to touch on that because the the question asked about a premonition, but you just made a distinction between a premonition and a prophecy. So what's the difference there? So typically a premonition is I see the actual thing happening. Okay, so that is seeing the future or the, the exactly. thing. Exactly. Yeah. You're traveling to the future and you're bringing the information back. Okay. Prophecy is, is you know, we've seen Harry Potter and the prophecy, right? <laughs> right. And you've heard of Nostradamus. Yep. And his complex con- convoluted quatrains, right? Yep. Prophecy is often exclusively done symbolically. And Nostradamus is, is fantastically symbolic. Yeah. Well, and he, he also dumbed it down to keep safe. Yeah. So, <laughs> change the names to protect the innocent <laughs> yeah history says that he was a lot more more specific in person than he was in his writings <laughs> you know and sometimes you know especially with with nostradamus i mean he was predicting some things that were 400 years in the future and of course he's going to call an airplane a dragon right right because he doesn't, he doesn't have know a what it is <laughs> exactly right so in his mind, it's the only thing that can be that big and fly, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, it's a, it's a dragon. Prophecy is often in that sort of genre. Okay. And with premonition, you said if it's a premonition, if it feels literal, it probably is. Yeah. But there are some caveats to that as well, right? Because when you see with the premonition is maybe a snippet, but you don't always have the context with that. Is that a fair statement? That is a fair statement, actually. There's also the factor of you're going forward in time. Mm -hmm. And time is a function of choice. Okay. Uh, You know, what what timeline you end up on is a function of choice. Right. This is why I say I don't usually predict the future. Because when people work with me, they change their choices. And so... It's, it's this constant state of flux. It's like, hey, let's play moving target game, right? <laughs> there are some times that you can do that. Like you can look ahead and, and see if somebody's going to pass. Or the other day I had a discovery call with someone and they were like, well, I need a new job. And I'm like, yeah, you'll be in the process, but you won't actually start your job until probably mid-October. And okay. I could see that because I'm not going to impact that. Right. And as long as they keep going down the path they're going down, that's going to be the outcome. Right. So when you deal with premonitions, you also deal with the possibility that you're going to change the future because you know about it. Oh. So just because your premonition didn't come true right. doesn't mean it wasn't true when you had it. It just means that having it changed your choices. Right. And as we look at the Shakespearean story of Oedipus, he, as a baby, is cast away because his father is told that he would be killed by his son. And it's in that casting away that he actually creates the circumstance that the son comes back to kill him, not knowing that it's right. his son and that that's his father. So it's right. it's it's really seems a little difficult to decide when and how to take those premonitions or those uh, prophecies. Yeah, the oracles at Delphi were bitches, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Prophecy is a tough one. Yeah. It really is because it is so lacking in context because yeah. you're just getting that little snippet. And we see that a lot in, in different movies and whatnot where people will see ahead and then think something's bad and it turns out it's good. And, you yeah. know, you can't you can't tell. It's the moral of the story is, ah, screw it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. Just live your life. You know, oftentimes prophecies tend to to mess with things such that they create their own outcome. There's no easy answer to give Renee there on whether it means what she thinks it means. Or... Well, she said she had a sense that she thought she knew what it meant. Yeah. So Should probably I... it means what you think it means. All right. So let's move to the next question from Gabrielle. Yeah, this one's a long one. Yeah, this one's got a little bit of a story to it. So I'll, I'll give but the... It's con- important to tell the story it in is. order for me to be able to say what happened. It so. is. So Gabrielle uh, reached out to you on Facebook and she gave you a little bit of context about what she was doing. Now, she was doing some work and she did say, you know, from a background perspective, her fiance had given her consent 
to work magic on or for him as long as her intentions were good and not to do any harm. Right. So that was a little bit of context because that that goes into what she's going to tell us in the story here. Now, she says, I did a love spell today for us because things have been rocky. I talked to the lady at the shop where I bought my supplies and she helped me find what I was looking for and told me that since the nature of the spell wasn't to force something into existence that wasn't there, but rather to mend something that is still in existence, the spell wasn't unethical. My fiance and I are also doing all the common sense, physical realm things to help. And she says here, magic is not a pill that solves all your problems, which you've told us on numerous occasions. Yes. Um, She said she started her spell and everything was going smoothly. She likes to work with fire. So she was using candles. She said the flames were tall and steady with no smoke. All good signs. After 20 minutes or so, I let my fiance know what I was up to and that things seemed to be going well. Probably a mistake to have said that. And he seemed pleased with the whole situation. But as soon as I got off the phone with him, the candle with my name on it started to burn faster and wax started pouring down the side and his slowed and kept burning for almost an hour after mine had burnt out. Then the weirdest thing happened. His name candle had completely burnt out. No wax, no wick, just a tiny ball of fire throwing out wisps of white smoke. I was really confused as to what happened. I talked to him about it after I finally just put out his candle. It burnt for almost an hour with nothing to burn, and I was starting to get a little concerned. And he claimed to be happy that I was using magic for this situation because he's seen it work in the past. I don't know what went wrong or right. So that's the story that we got from Gabrielle. There's a lot in there, and what happened? So Gabrielle, like... Almost everybody who listens to this podcast <laughs> is an empath. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's start with that. And I've spoken with Gabrielle on a on a discovery call. So so I you have the context here. <laughs> this with her. So we did not discuss this though. Okay. So that, that'll be interesting. But when the candles are burning evenly, and then she calls to tell him what's going on. She likely did what most empaths do and hooked into his energy. Oh, okay. And then proceeded to give him her energy to try and bring him into the process. It's an unconscious manipulation. Okay. She's trying to bring him into the magical process by lassoing him in with, by connecting her energy to his. Mm -hmm thereby draining her energy and causing her candle to burn faster and feeding her energy into him, thereby causing his candle to burn slower. And in fact, to continue to burn after everything burnable existed was gone (laughs) because it was no longer his energy. It was burning on. It was hers. Not a great dynamic, Gabrielle. (laughs) So good, but a good consciousness to be aware of, right? Because this is what we as empaths do when we have our partners, especially if we feel like the partner isn't providing us everything that we want from them or that they're not with us. We tend to throw our energy in and try and hook and pull and push and cajole and manipulate to get what we want. This is the the path of the empath. And so this is one of the reasons, one of the big reasons why I say do your work before you do your magic yeah. because this shit happens. Well, let's talk about this as a learning opportunity. And from that perspective, mm-hmm. she was doing the spell. Gabrielle was doing the spell. And then at that point, when she hooked her energy and, and started hooking into his energy and feeding the energy back and forth, does that actually contaminate the spell itself in terms of what it's intended to do to sort of help facilitate the what is there to mend what is there so the the practitioner at the store was correct Mm -hmm. when she told her that if it's to mend something that's already in place that it's not unethical right because what you're doing is you're putting the energy forth to mend the relationship and so therefore the relationship is a combination of the two energies. Right. And that's one interpretation that I gave you. But another interpretation is, and she didn't define how she set up the spell. Right. So if she set up the spell to be the candles represent each of them in the relationship and that the burning down of the candles 
was to fuel the relationship. Mm -hmm. And she was doing the healing work on the morphic field of the relationship. Then her candle burning faster after she talked to him would be an indicator of her leaving the relationship energetically and him staying in far too long right. because his lung passed the time. Mm-hmm. So depending on how she set up the structure, it's not clear as to how it was designed. You know, that's another possibility as to why that could have happened. Mm-hmm. Let's assume that it was the two of them in, as candles and burning was them burning together in relationship. It was it was focused on them as individuals rather than on the relationship itself. Okay. It, which would be the first interpretation that I gave, mm-hmm. right? In that case, when you hook into the other person and you try and shift things through that fashion, yes, it does divert the magic. Okay. Because you're working the energy directly. Yeah. Instead of indirectly through the magical process. Allowing the magic to do the work, you're pushing it a little. Exactly. Yeah. It's direct manipulation. Yeah. And then it, it also becomes unethical. Okay. Because now you're technically doing magic to someone, even with their permission, because yeah. you're hooking. Even, right? And even with the best of intention. Right. Well, and this is the thing. And it's it, it, this is what I keep saying is that. Your intentions can be great, but if your stories and your assumptions and your belief structures and your filters are not clear, then the best of intentions can become a freaking nightmare. Right. Because, you know, you're looking in the wrong direction and you're positioning in the wrong way and you're doing something that actually ends up being damaging and you didn't mean to. And as a magic practitioner, in this case, she's so close to it that it becomes difficult to disconnect emotionally from the from the spell that she's trying to cast. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Well, I hope that everything worked out for Gabrielle and and her fiance in whatever way it was supposed to and was best for them. And I hope that they are both very happy. Yes. All right. Next question. This one comes to us from Lou in Australia. Hey, Lou. And Lou says, and Lou has a two different sort of themes in, in the questions we've got here. The first one is, can someone actually die if they're attacked in the astral plane from extensive wounding? Yes, but it's very rare. Okay. More likely what would happen if somebody was intensively damaged on the astral would be that they might go catatonic. All right. So, and the next question, which sort of takes us into the second theme, and this has a couple of um, layers to it, but the general concept here is Lou wants to know what's the difference between your soul, your oversoul and your higher self. Okay. So I actually had to go look up what an oversoul was. Okay. <laughs> so, Cause I was like, what, what? <laughs> I, I remember somewhere very far back in my childhood, I had heard that phrase, right. but I could not for the life of me remember what it was. Turns out it is a transcendental meditation sort of word that is used to describe all the souls that inhabit the planet sort of thing. Okay. The oversoul is the collective consciousness of all of the the humans on the planet, as my understanding. Okay. Your higher self is the part of you that is, remember in the, the episode where we talked about what happens when you die? Yep. That, that there's the actor. Yes. <laughs> right? So your higher self is the actor. Okay. Not the part that you're playing, but right. the, the, the part of you that is your spirit that, that comes in and plays the role of you as the person you are today. Okay. And so your higher self is the actor. Okay. Soul and higher self are often used interchangeably. Okay. Your spirit, and that is used differently than the word soul. Your spirit is the part of you that is incarnated now. Okay. The the role that you're playing in this role case. That you're playing. Yeah. yeah. There's there's always a piece of you that exists on that higher plane, that mm-hmm. that actor state, right? And mm-hmm. so there's always Okay, multidimensional space. Yay, fun. <laughs> okay. So, 
ah. So it's, it's, it's not like we're in different places because we're not in different places because remember, this is the eternal moment of now. Right. And so everything is happening all at once, right this second. And so we're all in all places at once, right this second. And we're in all times at once, right this second. And so the differentiation of this particular timeline with this particular personality, with this particular spirit is, is like, yeah, whatever, right? Yeah. <laughs> only only the, those of us who are operating within our limited physical brains are actually fully engrossed in this portion of what is us. Okay. And if you want to try and understand what that's like from a soul level or, you know, a higher self level, think back on all the memories that you have from this life. No one memory is generally overpowering of your existence unless it's traumatic. Right. But, you know, if we talk about non-traumatic memories, Mm -hmm. it's sort of like that only multiple lifetimes. Okay. When we are operating in a state where we're trying to contact our higher selves. And that that phrase is a little screwed up because it's not like you're ever out of contact with your higher self. Right. <laughs> you are your higher self, but our, our heads get in the way and we go, oh, it's so hard and I can't talk to myself. And, blah, 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 and that's just crap. <laughs> you know, it's just your, your higher self is there all the time. And, you know, your neuroses may be screaming too loud for you to hear it. But, <laughs> you know, there's always that possibility that, you know, you're feeling like you can't get in touch with your higher self because of that going on in your brain. We've talked about how the soul and the higher self are sort of intertwined there. How does the oversoul that you talked about it being sort of part of that collective consciousness, how does that tie into the individual soul higher self tree? So keep in mind that my sum total of my knowledge about the oversoul is is from Wikipedia. I was just going to ask Wikipedia gives us all the answers. (laughs) I'm going to say this with a big old grain of salt. Okay. So based on my understanding of what the oversoul is it's the collective consciousness and and the collective unconscious to to look at at young right yep of the planet and so if you look at armageddon for instance Mm -hmm. armageddon could be phrased as the battle for control of the oversoul okay you know the whole concept of tipping point right where you're trying to get the oversoul to a new level of consciousness and that the the battle of Armageddon is the battle of the forces of one side trying to evolve the consciousness to the next level, and the battle of the forces of the other side trying to keep the status quo. Okay. That would be my best comment on, on what that is. And for those of us who are sensitive, especially as empaths, we tap into small portions of the oversoul all the time because we throw our energy fields out and we touch into multiple people's energy fields and we become a microcosm of the oversoul Okay. in that moment because we are everything in our purview. Okay. So with regards to that, as we talk about how those pieces sort of connect together and touch together, Lou asks, do they have their own personalities per se? And do they always match up with each other between incarnations or can they swap around? It sounds to me like they they are matched up from an incarnation perspective, but what's the personality piece? So I think I think she's using the word soul to mean like spirit okay. in my, my terminology. So okay. I'm going to answer the question from that perspective. And again, what I'm going to say is the spirit is the role that we play, right? right? The and role of the actor. The role of the actor, right? So we talked about soul families. Mm-hmm. And when you look at soul families... What you find is that oftentimes when you do past life regression within with members of the same soul family, what you may find is that they have sort of merged and split and merged and split. And so you may have several current people, spirits, Mm -hmm. remembering the same past life and being the same person. So soul families are not as distinct actors as we think they are. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So they're sort of, uh, they're a little more amorphous than that. You know, I try to explain it as simply as possible just because, you know, it's, we really don't have to know the complexities in order to function. So (laughs) just know that it is more complex than sort of, 
the average mind is able to hold. It sounds like you've got a theatrical troupe where everybody's in the show, but after so many shows, nobody, they can't necessarily remember which actor played which role. So they just remember all the roles together. Kind of. Yes. <laughs> I know and, that's and, super simplified, but <laughs> yeah. And they've been together so long that they've picked up each other's mannerisms yeah. and speaking styles. So they've, they've just sort of mushed into a, single conglomerate feeling. But if we were to talk about the the, the actor and the role uh, sort of line, does the actor have a different personality than the role that they play in this incarnation? Yes and no. Okay. Actors take on parts because they have resonance with them. Okay. An actor will choose a role then they'll want to be this person versus that person because this role speaks to them mm -hmm. and they have, they feel like they have something to bring to the role. Okay. Whereas this part, nah, I'm kind of bored. I don't really, I'm not really interested in doing that. I don't mm -hmm. really want to explore that part of myself. So yeah, in that way, you tend to find that people will have similar sort of lifetimes. Like I have many, many lifetimes as a warrior, right? Right. Because there was a part of me that was very warrior-like. <laughs> and it wasn't until this lifetime that I really kind of, you know, went, oh, yeah, okay, maybe that's a lot harder than I want. <laughs> <laughs> but up until then, it was, oh, I'm powerful, right? <laughs> and and I, I liked the power of it, right? Yeah. Despite the, the violence and the, you know, everything else that came along with it. So, you know, we, we tend to recreate our environment until we get what we need out of it. Okay. That's very cool. And that was a really interesting question. Thank you, Lou. That was, uh, that took us to places I don't know that we were ready to go. <laughs> yeah, well, Lou's badass. Yeah. So, you know. I, I had a lovely discovery call with her, too. Oh, fantastic. Those were great questions. Thank you to Renee, Gabrielle, and Lou for those questions. Lots of stuff in here. And folks, if you've got questions, you can see Kelly's making whole episodes, <laughs> grouping <laughs> questions together. So send them to her. And actually, there's there's a number of places. You, you've got the Facebook page and, and things like that. And we'll probably talk a little bit about your new Facebook group that you created for the Spirit Sherpa as well. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I'm going to encourage you that if you have questions to put them into the Spirit Sherpa after party group. Okay. Because um, there is a Facebook group, and we'll put the link in the show notes of this episode. If you're on the mailing list, you're already in the group. So <laughs> that's a good excuse to get on the mailing list because you get first notice of these things. But I'm going to encourage you to put your questions there because uh, Joey and I, well, mostly Joey, uh, <laughs> I forward it to him. And then he goes, wait, where were those questions? And what were they? And how do I? Da, da, da. And, and if you put them on the group, then I can just and you and you categorize them by clicking on the topic button that says questions, right? Yep. <clears throat> then when we go to answer questions, all we got to do is go in the group and hit the button that says questions, yep. and then we'll have them. And then we won't miss any. That's my way of saying, if you sent me a question and we haven't answered it yet, we've lost it, please send it again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> that. <laughs> Because it's been a wild few months and there were a bunch of questions coming in hot and heavy and we tried to answer some them as they came and some of them turned into episodes and some of them got answered in other things and some got here and we think we have them all now. But if you <laughs> sent one that we didn't answer, please send it again. We are not ignoring you. We just lost it. But please, yeah, come out to the Facebook group. It is called the Spirit Sherpa Podcast After Party. There will be bonus content on there. There will be all of the guests who have been on the show have been added into the group. So if you had questions for one of our guests, now it's your time to ask. <laughs> and they will also be posting content periodically to the group. Mm -hmm. So there'll be additional information that way. And I'll be on there every now and again. This is just my way of saying, hey, thanks for listening. And thanks for being part of the community. And, uh, you know, thanks for hanging out with us. And, and you know, feel free to ask questions in there and engage in, in, you know, get to know each other. Because this is another thing that I'm trying to do is create some community. Yeah. Because one of the things, especially for those people who are living in the Bible Belt or in sort of the areas where what we do is not so copious. You know, having a place to come where other people are on the same or sort of a similar spiritual path is is really 
a godsend in a lot of ways or a goddess send, depending on your chosen deity. It is always good to uh, find your tribe. It helps. It helps whatever path you're walking. So, and I want to remind everybody that coming up on September 7th and 8th, we have our retreat called Claim Your Gifts in Falls Church, Virginia. We do have spaces available still in that retreat. Uh, It's close to D.C., so if you wanted to fly in for it, it's a very quick metro ride out to where you're going. And the overnight at the location is really cheap. So (laughs) it's 50 bucks for the weekend. Perfect. Yeah, so it doesn't suck. Yeah. And uh, we're staying with Mitch, who's my my good friend and just a sweetheart of a guy. And I've known him for years. And it's he hosts a lot of events in his house. It's fantastic. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Awesome. And with Claim Your Gifts, they can get all of that information on kellysparta.com, right? Yes. If you go to kellysparta.com and you go to the events tab and you'll just see Claim Your Gifts and the date there. Okay. And go to kellysparta.com, by the way, and you can sign up for Kelly's mailing list. She talked about how you can get advanced notice on things like the Facebook group and, and any number of other things. I think you also send it there for... Um, when you've got other retreats and things coming up, the mailing list hears about it first, stuff like that. So it's a great way to get the heads up on what's going on in the Kelly Sparta world, the universe that is Kelly. The Sparta sphere. The Sparta sphere. Oh my goodness. Yeah. (laughs) I like Sparta sphere. Sphere. It's hard to say, but I like it. Carolyn coined that term years ago. (laughs) Carolyn Kepish, who was on the Planets in Retrograde episode, she coined that phrase years ago when she was one of my clients, actually. And she was like, I'm here for my time in the Sparta sphere. It's where I come to level up. She walked in the door (laughs) saying that one day. I was like, wow, that's cool. What's the Sparta sphere? (laughs) It is you. (laughs) And evidently it was me. So yeah, there it is. You know, I also want to mention that uh, I am on a mission. I don't set goals very often because, you know, I just don't. But I'm on a mission. I want, so I'm turning 50 this year. (laughs) My birthday's on November 1st, and I want to double my podcast listenership by the time I turn 50. I want it to be my birthday present to myself. So what that means is that I started, when I set this goal last week, I started at just over 20,000 downloads. Okay. And now I want 40,000 downloads for my birthday. (laughs) <laughs> wow. And so I need you guys to help me. That's a huge goal because it took us a whole year to get to 20,000. And I am working really hard. I'm I'm reaching out to other podcasters to to get interviewed and to to trade interviews with them and I'm working really hard to get the word out. And so if you have gotten anything out of this podcast and you love me in any way, shape or form, I would so appreciate your support uh, in, in making my birthday present happen. Having moved here from Boston and having just established friends, you know, I'm not going to be able to do the big party thing that I would normally do up in Boston, but you guys could be the party for me and I would so appreciate that. Well, that would be pretty fantastic. Fantastic. So you can help out Kelly by sharing, obviously, on all of your social media. You can share, let people know. And, but even people you're talking to in your daily life, if you feel like there's content here, it's a great way to share and just sort of send them off to find it. And also, we always ask, subscribe and rate the podcast. That's another great way to uh, increase visibility and any number of listening applications that you might be using to listen to the podcast. So definitely please do that and help Kelly reach her goal. Yeah. If you're in Facebook groups that that are like, you know, the light workers or, you know, things like that, that are things that are related, right? Yeah. And you see an, a discussion come up and there's something that's related to an episode that you've listened to, please post the episode. Yeah. If you do it, it's sharing. If I do it, it's self-promotion. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not cool if I do it. So right. But please make it relevant. Don't just randomly spam. That's not what we're trying to do. I want it to be part of the conversation. Not. I don't want to come off as a spammer. Right. Um, you know, my goal is always to expand and extend people's understanding of the world, not to uh, be a pain in their ass. So. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, folks. Share and care and come and join the... 
<laughs> come and join the community on Facebook to be part of the tribe and uh, ask questions and just just interact. It's a fun place and fun way for people to talk about things, whether it's about the latest episode or just anything that's come up where you're like, oh, I want to ask Kelly this. And you throw it into there as a question. And if we can put it into an episode, we absolutely will. Absolutely. And we may answer it on the on the spot and put it in an episode. Who knows? Could, it could be happen. a double whammy. Could be a double, double whammy. whammy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That is all that we have time for this week. But be sure to join us next time as Kelly adds another chapter into your guide to energy, magic, and the spirit world. I'm Joey C. here with Kelly Sparta, and you have been listening to Spirit Trippa. So long, everyone. Bye. Bye. I travel over 13,000 now, so I leave behind a little fear. Spirit Trippa is the sole property of Kelly Sparta Enterprises and is distributed under Creative Commons BY-NC-ND 4.0 license. For more information about this licensing, please go to creativecommons.org. Any request for deviations to this licensing should be sent to K-E-L-L-E at K-E-L-L-E-S-P-A-R-T-A dot com. That's Kelly at KellySparta.com. To sign up or to get more information on the programs, offerings, and services referenced in this episode, please go to KellySparta.com. This episode of Spirit Trippa has been produced by Honu Voice Productions. Thank you.